died some years ago, and it's in his memory that this series of lectures uh, has been established, sorry. And also as a member of the Kennedy School faculty, I'm here to welcome our speakers, Dr. Stephen Hyman, who is the director of the National Institute of Mental Health, and Professor Joseph Martin, who is the dean of Harvard Medical School. We have a great many sponsors of this lecture, for those of you who might have noticed the poster, and that is because Norman's work reached out in so many directions. His training was as a clinical psychiatrist and a psychoanalyst, but as one of his colleagues pointed out, there was never anything he did that did not have a public policy goal. In fact, in, in thinking about tonight, I reread uh, parts of one of his books called, that he published in 1972 called Drugs and the Public, and I'm on a search committee for professorships at the Kennedy School, and I realized, hmm, that book would probably get him tenure here. And so it was very exciting to see the policy aspect of so much of what a clinical psychoanalyst was writing about drugs and addiction many years ago. One of the things he wrote, which is relevant to tonight's speaker, is he said, we need to know more about basic pharmacologic mechanisms and the long-term social consequences of drug use, in which he included political and legal consequences. We still don't have all the answers and probably not even most of the questions, but Norman struggled to understand how each of the players from the individual through every level of every institution of society was involved in a complex feedback mechanism when it came to addiction. And these all had to be understood in relation to each other. The one area in which he had no expertise whatsoever is the subject of tonight's lecture. In fact, he quite happily admitted that never in his life had he ever seen anything through a microscope. So <laughs> how he got to medical school was always one of the great questions of our time. Uh, but he, uh, for those of you who knew him, had his own microscopic vision, but we'll talk about that on another occasion. Tonight, uh, Dr. Stephen Salen, who is with us, who is the chief of staff at the Dana-Farber Cancer Center and a professor of pediatric oncology, who did some work with Norman many years ago, is just going to talk for a few minutes before our speakers about what it was like to work with Norman uh, in the field of drugs. Uh, thank you all for coming, and I look forward to your remarks, Dean Martin, and your speech. Well, thank you very much, Dorothy, and thank you very much for having me here. I was, uh, I was asked to speak in part because uh, of the three of us, I was one who had, in fact, worked with Norman, and it was to share a little bit of the man as well as the work that, uh, that I was given this opportunity. I, uh, I might say that, that I met Norman uh, over 25 years ago. I had just come out of the uh, submarine service where uh, I was working with the Navy Neuropsychiatric Research Institute, and we were studying the biochemical correlates of life crisis. And I was a pediatrician, and I thought, well, <clears throat> I am going to come to the children's hospital in Boston and at Harvard, and I'm going to sort out childhood depression, childhood schizophrenia. This is uh, before there were CAT scans, before there were MRI, before there was SPECT, before there was molecular biology. And in fact, I ended up in a very psychoanalytic psychiatric department, and one of my mentors was Norman Zinberg. <laughs> And for those who didn't know him, we've already heard upstairs about his uh, bushy eyebrows and his sort of gleeful look. He was very enthusiastic about his work. And he, uh, he talked a lot about drug use and uh, very little about drug abuse. And he had had a friend who uh, had a child with leukemia. And that child uh, was suffering some of the nausea and vomiting associated with anti-leukemic therapy and had uh, heard through uh, the drum beats that smoking marijuana might, in fact, allay the, the uh, vomiting associated with cancer chemotherapy. And we were very interested in this observation. And I have to say that uh, Norman Zinberg was uh, a man who was thinking out of the box long before the rest of us knew that we were 
thinking in the box. <laughs> and he started thinking about how we could address this, this problem. And after about uh, 12 weeks as a psychiatrist, I realized that if I was going to sort out any mechanism of any disease, I was going to have to switch to become an oncologist. But I finished my year as a psychiatrist, and Norman and I designed a project where we were able to, uh, to uh, obtain delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol, the active ingredient of marijuana, from the U.S. government. And Norman, who might not have looked down a microscope and certainly uh, wasn't, wasn't big on scientific process and clinical trial, but he and I put together a placebo-controlled study of delta-9 THC in patients receiving cancer chemotherapy. And lo and behold, um, we ended up publishing this in the New England Journal of Medicine, comparing it subsequently with conventional antiemetics. And as recently as uh, eight or 10 hours ago, I was actually ordering oral marinol, the commercial product, uh, so that there actually is a total connection to the patient. Um, it was a brilliant time, and it was a lot of fun, and I thought I would take two minutes to share with you, because I know Norman and I got a huge kick out of this, what it was like to study marijuana at the time. Our very first patient was a Harvard uh, Divinity School student. I hope you remember this, Dorothy. <coughs> who uh, had come out of sort of the most fundamental areas of, uh, of East Texas, uh, had gone to uh, get his first degree in the clergy in Tennessee, married some fundamental kind of rural Tennessee uh, woman. And he was at the Brigham Hospital at the time, and he was sick, and he said, I'd like to be part of this study. And it was over, uh, I remember it was over the Labor Day weekend, and the very first day I came in, I told him about the study, gave him the drug, and uh, apparently he got quite high. Came back the following morning, the Sunday of the three-day weekend, and he was, it was terrific. I gave him the next drug. It was the placebo, and I came in the following Monday morning, and there was <coughs> his daddy and his mommy, these really kind of rural people, and his wife and his two children, one under each uh, arm of the grandparents, and he apologized all over, and he said, oh, Dr. Salen, Dr. Salen, I'm so sorry I had to spoil your study, but I started to get nausea and vomiting, and I think it was the placebo again. So I got a friend, and I smoked. <laughs> and all of a sudden, I could see the eyes of his children getting enormous because their daddy had smoked. And this grandpa came, and he put his arms around both of these kids, and he says, that's OK, children, because your daddy, he didn't smoke tobacco. <laughs> 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 that, uh, that and many other stories were part of Norman, part of our work, and uh, it gave me great pleasure on this very day to be able to prescribe this very drug that Norman was so active in presenting. So I hope that gives you some of the flavor of the man. Um, and what I would like now to do is to introduce uh, the dean of uh, the Harvard Medical School, uh, Dr. Uh, Joe Martin, who all of us who are faculty members at that school are ever so glad as our dean, and uh, whose field is tightly connected uh, to the subject of tonight's talk. Uh, Joe. <coughs> <clears throat> Mrs. Zinberg, uh, friends of Norman, who I, uh, I'm sorry to say I did not have the pleasure of knowing, uh, and everyone who's come tonight to hear a very distinguished man in American science talk about a field that many of us have great interest in. My introduction of Steve will be very personal because he and I have been friends for a long time. And I will insinuate his career and mine a bit, just because that, uh, I think, is exactly how we came to know each other. Uh, Steve graduated from Yale, we'll forgive him for that, in 1974, uh, and then went off to the University of Cambridge to do a master's in the philosophy of science, history and philosophy of science. Came back in 76 to Harvard Medical School, where he graduated uh, with honors in 1980. And it was during that time when he was either a third or a fourth year medical student, and I had just arrived at the Mass General Hospital as head of neurology from Montreal at McGill, where I'd been before, that Steve came by one day to talk about neuroscience and research on the brain. And 
And uh, he asked the question early on, you know, is it possible for a psychiatrist to study the brain in a way that will have some meaningful outcome in the end? We developed a friendship as a result of that. He graduated, did an internship in psychiatry or in medicine before psychiatry. Think of how long it takes to get to where he is. I want you to note these dates. Um, he took the additional training in psychiatry, joined the Department of Neurology as a fellow, and then went after these uh, long discussions about the future of psychiatry and how he might contribute to it, entered into a prolonged period of post doctoral training in molecular biology with Professor Howard Goodman, who was director of that department at the Massachusetts General Hospital. And he continued with that kind of very detailed, in-depth study of molecular biology. Uh, and then, just as the time uh, arrived for him to set up his own laboratory, I was uh, able to help him do so in the newly developing laboratories at the Charlestown campus of the Massachusetts General Hospital. And uh, then our paths parted for a while, and I went off to San Francisco for eight years. And uh, one of the great uh, attractions to my coming back was the fact that this man, now middle-aged after all that <laughs> trading, uh, would be at Harvard. But unfortunately, in the process of, of uh, my moving back and his making other <laughs> career decisions, uh, but good for all of us now, he has taken the very important position of director of the National Institute of Mental Health in Washington. Uh, his research has been uh, very profound. He has been interested in how neurotransmitters and drugs that alter neurotransmitters uh, in the brain change the nature of gene function. So how does a, taking a drug or how does a transmitter that we know many drugs act upon influence the gene regulation, particularly in the basal ganglia, the striatum? And he's continued this work at NIMH after he uh, left uh, Harvard. He's been down there for two and a half years. Uh, he's done an outstanding job of bringing the very best of science to both the intramural program within the NIMH and to be and, to, and being a major stimulant for science in psychiatry across the country. Uh, we hope, of course, one day to bring him back to Boston, uh, but I'm unable to date to get a commitment on exactly when that'll be. Uh, nevertheless, we always welcome him home. And Steve, we're looking forward very much to your lecture entitled Addiction, Where Does the Brain Disease End and Personal Responsibility Begin? It's going to be impossible for me to live up to that introduction. Um, and, uh, and it is really true that uh, uh, Dr. Martin did actually uh, get me going at the most vulnerable time when I was uh, beginning uh, in, in science, and who knows what would have happened to me without, without your help. So uh, I, I do really appreciate that introduction. Now, normally I give lectures which would be entirely opaque to many people here, um, and I promised uh, Dr. Zinberg uh, that I would not um, give such a lecture, especially because in the spirit of Norman, who I, I, I must confess I also did not know, uh, this lecture is supposed to have a public policy aspect to it. So after prolonged negotiation, and I have to tell you, no one has ever won a negotiation with Dorothy, uh, <laughs> we came up with this title. But it, it, it's actually a very important and topical and timely issue. And the real, the real issue is uh, how can we have a concept of a brain disease and still at the same time understand that people can be addressed as full-blooded human beings and indeed how can we treat them as moral agents? Now, perhaps on reflection, uh, one can imagine a compromised position, but in fact, in much of public policy, we get trapped in this either or. Either something is a disease, and, and one comes by that in an involuntary way and is held blameless, or else uh, there is some moral flaw which produces the apparent symptoms and illness and therefore, society is ambivalent about how we might treat people. 
And addiction is an area where this uh, very peculiar and indeed crude dichotomy uh, rears its ugly head in public policy all the time. But we should recognize that it is held very broadly in the United States. And one uh, can look back not very many years to recognize that uh, HIV was, uh, and, and AIDS was an area where, uh, where public sympathy and public support took an enormous amount of education uh, because uh, when, uh, whenever an illness becomes stigmatized in this way or associated uh, in such a way that we hold people uh, in some ways uh, responsible in, in its entirety for it, uh, we then uh, as a society often do not want to provide the resources and the, and the appropriate comfort. But what, again, when you reflect, Many diseases are like this. So in heart disease, for example, um, as in addiction, one um, comes into the world with a genetic vulnerability. And then actually, uh, if one is at risk of heart disease, one has a great deal of behavioral uh, influence over whether those genes will express themselves. So whether we exercise or not, whether we diet or not, uh, whether we control our blood pressure or not. Um, Nobody intends to get heart disease. It's simply that uh, one might want to experiment with, uh, you know, a piece of cake now and again. Uh, and uh, interestingly, we hold people who develop heart disease blameless. Similarly, I would argue no one sits down one day and decides to become a drug addict. No one sits down and says, um, gee, I think a great plan for life is to be a social deviant and to be marginalized. Uh, indeed, uh, for a variety of reasons, people experiment with drugs, and I, I don't want to make any moral judgment about this, but uh, people do experiment. Uh, and those who are vulnerable uh, get captured. It's not everybody, it's, it's some. Um, and in an interesting way, we do not hold them blameless. Now, in general, Stigma of this sort um, has very problematic and deleterious effects when it comes to thinking of treating something as a disease, as a public health problem, because people are ashamed, they don't identify themselves in clinical settings, and they tend not to get good treatment. But before I uh, stigmatize stigma, we should recall also that it's a very useful tool. Right now, uh, one of the major tools in fighting another uh, addiction other than heroin and cocaine addiction, which is the, the dreadful plague of addiction to nicotine, is being fought on the battlefield of stigma, only this time it's good stigma, right? We're trying to make tobacco unattractive, and, uh, and so indeed uh, it is very hard to uh, make any generalizations about uh, what is in the social interest in terms of what we consider voluntary versus involuntary, what we stigmatize, what we don't stigmatize. But to come back to the question at hand with respect to drug addiction, we have this core problem. On the one hand, many people see and treat drug addiction as a social and moral problem in its entirety, and other people would like to treat it as a public health problem. Is there truly a paradox here? Is, it, is the crude distinction made in much of our society that something is of the spirit and voluntary and therefore unrelated to disease versus is something uh, biological, perhaps genetic, and determined, unwanted, and therefore worthy of being called a disease, a distinction that has any basis in biology. And um, I would argue, of course, that that's not the case, that we do not have this either or, that just as with heart disease, so with brain disease, behavioral, indeed voluntary actions combined with risk can produce diseases, but now here it's different from heart disease because the brain is the very organ of volition, can produce diseases which impact our voluntary behavior itself. So with that introduction, we're left with the problem, how is it in the brain that one could have something that arguably is called a disease, and in the case of addiction, 
which is defined generally as compulsive drug use that a person finds themselves unable to control despite negative consequences, how is that definition compatible on the one hand with a disease model and on the other hand with personal responsibility? And indeed, how is it that physicians, are they being incoherent when on the one hand they have this public health disease model, but on the other hand they know that if they are going to successfully engage an addicted person, an alcoholic, for example, in treatment, they often have to, uh, in fact, indeed, they must engage that person's uh, moral agency. They have to get that person involved in and ultimately owning their behavior. How can we address this paradox? So if I can have the first slide, is it, are they, otherwise I'll have to give a very vivid, uh, vivid talk. Are the, is there a projectionist? Is there, yeah. is there a slide? Oh, here, here, here. Well, yes. Okay, so here's the dichotomy. On, on the one hand, many people, and this is, this is r rather, we, we recognize this is crude, right? But many people equate biology, disease, and an involuntary state, right? And, uh, and on the other hand, um, people would say that if something is of the, sp uh, is, uh, involves voluntary behavior, it's of the spirit, and it should not be called a disease. And, um, and uh, while we, we generally know better, this, this dichotomy gets itself played out in public policy all the time. And now, if, otherwise I, I will have to, uh, okay, time for negotiation. <laughs> so let me just, here we go, okay, okay. And I suspect there will not be, a, there will not be a pointer, so I will have to be uh, a, uh, rather vivid in my description. Oh, a laser, incredible. Okay, could we back up one? Okay, and dim the lights. So the important thing with respect to thinking about voluntary behaviors and involuntary behaviors coexisting in a, in a person is to recognize that the brain is roughly modular. Now, all of the parts of the brain are interconnected with other parts of the brain. But in fact, there are different circuits in the brain which have relatively different functions. So at the crudest level of analysis, and this is rather phrenological, uh, based on uh, initially on symptoms people had with strokes, different brain regions were identified as being associated with certain functions. So the, this part of the brain was associated with some speech functions, and another part of the brain is involved with the primary aspects of sensation. Apparently, nobody, can we turn the lights down a bit more and then people can nap uh, or, or whatever? <laughs> and another part of the brain is involved with the processing of visual information. And if I can have the next slide, and this is, uh, there, there will not be a quiz on this, uh, people using the tools of physiology and more recently tools of functional neuroimaging like MRIs uh, have begun to map uh, distributed parallel circuits in the brain that subserve certain functions. So this is the current oversimplified wiring diagram of, the, of visual processing. And this is an even more oversimplified diagram of somatic sensation, the, the processing of touch. And of course, these things do eventually have to come together because we reassemble a world uh, that is both tactile and visual. 
Can I have the next slide? And the other thing that is very important to recognize in thinking about this, how voluntary and automatic behaviors or driven behaviors can coexist in one brain, is to recognize that, uh, that the brain does a great deal of unconscious processing that has an enormous impact on behavior. So here, despite my molecular bent, I would say that Freud was right at, about at least one thing, that there's a lot of unconscious processing in the brain. We might disagree about some of the details. But this, here I've just um, gotten some of the, I don't think the, the pointer may not be quite bright enough to see. But if you look down at the bottom of this diagram, where it says V1, V2, this is the origination in the brain of visual processing. And what I'm going to just describe for you here is how much goes on in the background. When a scene uh, hits our retina, it gets sent to a processing way station in the middle of the brain, the thalamus, and then is sent back to the back of the brain, to the primary visual cortex. And there isn't a homunculus sitting in the back of the brain watching the movie. Instead, the brain uh, analyzes incoming visual information in several ways. Part of the brain is telling us eventually what an object is. Part of it is telling us where it is in visual space. The part of the brain that is telling us what an object is actually analyzes, breaks down the visual input into form, motion, color. And ultimately, this is resynthesized sort of toward, farther toward the top of the diagram. Uh, and again, much is left out, but this is obviously heuristic, into a visual world and together with other sensations into the world that we experience. Now, we on introspection have no ability to be aware of the, what's going on in background in terms of this first analysis of the visual world and then resynthesis. Or think about any simple motor act. When I reach for this glass of water at the podium, it's a good thing that I do not consciously have to decide the precise trajectory that I'd be very clumsy indeed if I had to do this, the precise trajectory, which muscles had to fire for so many tens or hundreds of milliseconds uh, at, at different times in order to have this precise motion. All of this is taken care of for me in the background. If I can have the next slide. So it is for emotional processing. Now this is, I, I have to say that understanding the circuitry underlying emotion is in its very earliest days. And we're nowhere nearly as far along as we are in understanding the processing underlying our visual world or motor acts. But uh, and indeed, you can, you can simply, you can see the, there, there is a larger grain of boxes and fewer arrows. Uh, and this, this is just a diagram of one aspect of emotional processing, which is fear processing in the brain. But the point that is critical here is that emotion is not some inchoate part of our, our brains or our makeups, which is primarily involved only in a subjective feeling of fear or reward. Rather, emotional processing has very specific functions in the brain. So in the case of fear, for example, um, for it to have its survival value, it's critical that, uh, that when we come across something which is life-threatening, that, that, that an emotional system, that is a system which appraises the survival value, the valence of something in our environment, then creates an adaptive response in our brains and bodies. So coming across something fearful uh, may, of course, have a subjective concomitant, I feel fear, but the business end of this circuitry down here is turning on our fight or flight response. So that, for example, blood that was busy involved in digesting dinner now goes to our thigh muscles so we can escape danger. So that stress hormones are released so that instead of storing fat, we're now burning calories and so forth. 
And again, we have no, we, we may have awareness of our heart racing, but we have no access on introspection to this processing. This is all automatic and unconscious. And of course, so, so it had better be. Some things are too important with respect to survival to, lead, to permit the delays and hesitations that reflection would create. Can I have the next slide? Okay, so now how does this idea that the brain might be relatively modular and that there is a lot of unconscious processing that leads to automatic behavior help us think about addiction and help us think about this paradox of compulsive voluntary acts, right? Reaching for another drink when you know you shouldn't have one, but being, in, in some essence, feeling compelled, being unable to control it. Well, first, just the... Uh, uh, the, the first thing, point I want to make is that I want to focus really on these emotional and behavioral aspects of addiction. What I want to get away from is this idea of physical dependence, uh, which is important and it's there, but it's not the interesting part for our purposes. And I'll come back to the, to the, to the issues of physical dependence perhaps if we have time for questions. But the essence of addiction is not we don't, people do not continue to use drugs just because they fear withdrawal sim symptoms. Indeed, one of the striking things about people who are addicted is the very high risk of relapse even uh, months or years after they have stopped uh, a drug and, uh, and have been fully detoxified and are beyond the period of any withdrawal syndrome. Can I have the next slide? Okay, so now, I, I introduced emotional circuits with fear, but there's another very important set of emotional circuits that are involved with learning what's good for us, learning what is life-enhancing. And in the brain, this is a cartoon now of the human brain, uh, a critical circuit, or the beginnings of what we're understanding to be a circuit, involves nerve cells, neurons that start in the midbrain and go to something called the nucleus accumbens. I mean, the names really don't matter here. But what we do, what you do have to know is that these neurons use a neurotransmitter called dopamine to signal each other. Now, just as for survival, we need uh, mechanisms in the brain to help us escape danger, to avoid danger, and, and um, indeed, I listed thing told you about changes in blood pressure, changes in stress hormones, but there are even behavioral concomitants of the fear response that are automatic. Animals, for example, freeze when they're, when they're frightened, and this was uh, adaptive presumably because predators' vision is tuned better to motion than to form. It's not such a good idea now that the automobile has been invented. Um, and it's interesting, we even have, we even have uh, residue of this. I, Probably all of us saw many times over the tape of the Atlanta Olympics when the bomb went off in the park. And if you look at it from the point of view of behavioral neurobiology, what you see is people first freezing for a bit and then, and then running off. So there are vestiges of these very automatic behavioral responses. Well, in addition to these avoid behaviors, we need approach behaviors, right? We, we need to, uh, there are some things that are life enhancing. So, some of these are hardwired, uh, for example, sex, right? If sex were not hardwired, uh, as I've said many times before, nature's experiment with sexual reproduction would not have succeeded and the yeast would have inherited the earth and everyone would be budding asexually. <laughs> and uh, and this, uh, this is a very strong bias. Uh, it's really, uh, it's very hard for the uh, cold cognition of the cerebral cortex up here uh, sometimes to, uh, to uh, compete with this uh, profound behavioral bias. We can. Humans can think themselves into or out of lots of things. Uh, but this, again, gets to this idea that the brain is not one thing, but there are, in essence, circuits that form com competing voices in the brain. But things are not only hardwired. You have to be able to learn. Right? You don't know what you're going to, just as you don't know everything that you're going to come across in life that could hurt you or kill you, you don't know everything that you're going to come across in life that is life enhancing or good. 
And for example, we know in rat experiments that if a rat you know, meets up with something new and good like a chocolate chip, uh, the rat releases dopamine in this, in this circuit. And uh, to make a lot, of, um, a lot of science sort of briefly encapsulated, what dopamine seems to be doing is it's a, it's a learning signal. It's a teaching signal. In the past, it was simplified that dopamine equals euphoria in the brain, but, but probably not. What dopamine is probably doing is signaling to the brain that something is good and that we should learn about it, that we have to pay attention to it and, and learn about it. Now, one of the things about learning, so this is another very important concept that I have to introduce, is that learning involves long-term physical changes in the brain. It can't be any other way. If you think back to um, facts that you know from your childhood or even facts like carrying your address around in your mind, how, how does that get stored? Uh, now, the short answer is we, we actually don't know. We don't, we don't know either where in the brain or precisely how, but I think we know the form of the answer. And the form of the answer is that the connections between neurons, between nerve cells, have to be physically altered. New ones added, some pruned, others strengthened, others weakened in order to store these memories, in order to learn. So dopamine is a signal that, among other things, is going to encode learning, get the brain to learn about things that ought to be life enhancing, things that we ought to approach. Just as in the fear system, we're going to learn in a deeply ingrained way about things that can hurt us. OK, can I have the next slide? OK, now this is just, uh, uh, how, how did people begin to learn about this? So there were some very famous experiments done in the 1950s by Olds and Milner uh, in, in Canada, and, and many follow-on experiments. And these were very classic behaviorist experiments. Uh, but basically, what Olds and Milner did, uh, and the laser pointer is, is I, I think I'm sort of killing your battery, and I apologize. But uh, basically, what they did is they hooked a lever up in a, in a cage to, uh, an electric, to an electrode. And when the rat pressed the lever, it would get electrical a stimulation of its brain, and they move the electrode around in the brain, simply asking, are there regions of the brain where a rat would work for electrical stimulation? And most areas of the brain, of course, uh, the rat, uh, it was relatively neutral. In some areas, if the rat ever hit the lever, it would never hit it again. Presumably, these kinds of aversive reactions might involve pain or fear responses. There were a small number of regions in the brain where the rat pressed the lever and then would press it tens of thousands of times in succession if it survived, ignoring food and water. And in the pre-computer days, when the investigators had to be counting these lever presses, presumably also threatening the lives of the scientists. <laughs> and when it was asked where, uh, wh what were the locations in the brain that produced this, it was, in fact, this dopamine system that I talked about. Now, again, this led to a lot of oversimplification. This was called the pleasure centers, very phrenological, right, a center. And dopamine was associated with euphoria. And we've become more sophisticated with that. But this was the first data actually pointing out a part of the brain, a circuit in the brain, which might be responsible for what was called then, because it's just behaviorist experiment, just reinforcement. Can I have the next slide? And again, I'm to, there's a lot of science behind this, but when you think about addictive drugs, when you look at what they are, it turns out most of them began as natural plant products, so opiates from opium poppies, cocaine from the coca leaf, nicotine from tobacco, alcohol from fermentation, but all of them turn out to be Trojan horses, molecular mimics. That is, every one of these uh, addictive drugs looks chemically like one of the neurotransmitters that nerve cells use to communicate with each other. And it turns out that all of the neurotransmitters involved somehow control or regulate this brain reward pathway so that opiates mimic the brain's own endogenous opiate peptide, sometimes called the endorphins. And cocaine looks enough like dopamine, the, the key compound that we were talking about, the key neurotransmitter, that it fools the mechanism that normally sucks dopamine back up into nerve cells and terminates its action in, in, in the synapse. Okay, so 
all of these addictive drugs are Trojan horses. And this is this it's sort of interesting when you think about it. Humans, you know, uh, have contacted many plant substances during the course of, of their history. And um, I used to give a lecture to the medical students, uh, tr trying to get them interested, uh, hopefully successfully, uh, entitled, Why Does the Brain Prefer Opium to Broccoli? <laughs> and it, it sounds like a silly question, but the fact is that op the opium poppy has in it one alkaloid that, that mimics, that masquerades as a neurotransmitter, and presumably broccoli uh, has uh, no such virtues. And this, this is getting a bit dated, but you may recall that George Bush had a particular aversion to broccoli, so that, uh, I thought that was a major cultural contribution. Okay, can I have the next, can I have the next uh, slide? Now, so Olds and Milner, you know, showed us, uh, and, and there are many followers in more detailed ways, the importance of this reward circuit. Is it relevant in humans? Well, using functional imaging, that is techniques like magnetic resonance imaging or PET scanning, in this case, this is uh, functional magnetic resonance imaging, we're beginning to see the correlates of brain activity in the living, thinking, feeling human brain. And this is really marvelous. And we're beginning actually to be able to see in the human brain the, uh, the, the results of stimulation uh, by drugs, but also by, uh, by cognitive or emotional probes. And this is simply a picture of, uh, if you just look at the top left brain section, I can't really point, and you'll have to take my word for it, that what you see is after cocaine, in a person who is addicted to cocaine, there's an important ethical aspect to these experiments. You would never give a human subject um, a, a novel euphoria from a drug of abuse. You don't want to introduce somebody to this. So these uh, experiments are not as clean scientifically, but but one has to obviously meet these ethical standards. So these are people who are already habitual cocaine users, and the dose is somewhat less than their habitual cocaine dose. But at any rate, what you see is at a time when, you, uh, when they're rating themselves as, as in actually craving drug, the, you see the concomitance of neural activity in the nucleus accumbens. And, and, it, and indeed, in many other correlated areas, and in this way, we're going to be able to assemble some of this information into actual reward circuits in the brain. But, but we're beginning to understand that these rodent models are actually relevant to the human brain. And can I have the next slide? OK, so now let's just deal with the example of cocaine. So what I told you was that dopamine is a signal that basically says, this is good. You know, let's do it again. And let's learn about this. Let's remember how we did it. I think uh, uh, a colleague, uh, David Potter, at the medical school actually just summarized it. You know, that was good. Let's do it again. And let's remember exactly how we did it. OK, so I've reduced what is a complex circuit to just two neurons. Uh, and one can imagine a natural reward. So uh, you know, uh, um, a, a rat discovers a chocolate chip uh, or a graduate student uh, does two years of research, writes a paper, submits it, and gets it accepted, and you get a certain amount of dopamine. <laughs> now, because these drugs of abuse are Trojan horses, what the cocaine user discovers is that they can, and, and I, pardon me for those of you who have heard this joke before, but I have you know limited behavioral repertoire. <laughs> What the drug abuser discovers is that they can short circuit the whole research and paper writing and review process. Because instead of activating these complex natural reward circuits, what happens is that by putting cocaine in their brains, they inhibit the ability of neurons to clear dopamine out of synapses. And this circuit gets bombarded with more dopamine for a longer period of time than it has ever seen before. And what drug abusers find is that this is incredibly reliable, right? Uh, unlike writing a paper or searching for highly palatable new food. And the problem, though, for the person who ends up addicted is, uh, is that this is, there, there's a barb in this. And that is uh, twofold. One is uh, this uh, 
the function of dopamine I've been telling you about, dopamine is about learning about things. And, and learning in the context of strong emotional stimuli marked by dopamine are things best remembered. I think this is more obvious to people intuitively on the fear side of emotion. But a child does not stick their hand into a flame twice. You don't have to study that. Um, the, these are these memories it, re related to emotional arousal to survival value are, the mo are extremely deeply ingrained. It's not like studying neuroanatomy, which takes a lot of rehearsal before you forget it. <laughs> this, so, so this memory function is part of the, the entrapment, but there's something else. All cells in the body are involved in what's called homeostasis. That is, um, to preserve their health, cells adapt to novel, potent changes in their environment. Now, the, the, the person using drugs may, as a sum total of their you know, brain processing, may feel great. But this neuron, individual neurons are pretty dumb. And what this neuron knows is it's seeing an enormous amount of dopamine. So it is going to adapt to decrease the efficacy of dopamine, right? It is simply undergoing a, an expectable homeostatic adaptation. And what I will argue is that these homeostatic adaptations are critical when it comes to things like dependence and withdrawal but that the learning aspects of dopamine are what lead to these very long-term, indeed lifelong risks of relapse whenever somebody comes across a reminder, a cue, something that uh, would be a setting in which they would have used drugs in the past. And even people who have given up smoking cigarettes know that after a festive meal, you know, they may get an intense urge for a cigarette. The problem, of course, for a former heroin addict is that when they see their old friends or their old shooting gallery, you know, they may get this intense urge that may actually lead to relapse. Can I have the next slide? And this, this simply shows this principle of homeostasis. That is, if we put cocaine in the brain, we block this dopamine reuptake transporter that clears dopamine, and we get the, what the drug abuser feels to be the uh, wanted effect, but after a repetition, uh, the cells begin to adapt. And if I can have the next slide. Okay, now here, I, I couldn't resist putting in a few gruesomely technical slides. It's, it's in, it's, it, I, I was fighting with my nature and those evil circuits won out. Uh, so this is, uh, and, and this is not the bad slide, by the way. This, uh, this is a picture of a presynaptic nerve cell. It, it's, this is our midbrain dopamine nerve cell that's going to release dopamine. And of course, cocaine is going to block the reuptake of dopamine, so there's a lot of dopamine around. But in a physical sense, what does dopamine do? How does it have these effects? Well, neurotransmitters, chemical signals in the brain, have their effect by binding to molecules called receptors. Uh, the receptor basically is a molecule that tells this cell, you know, there's dopamine around. And uh, one kind of dopamine receptor, the dopamine D1 receptor, so it's one of the five known dopamine receptors, appears to have a critical role in both homeostasis and learning. And if I can have the next slide. Um, what I'm going to show you here, this is, this is a, a laboratory data slide, but I, I, I'm going to use it to make a point. What we've done, and this is actually from my lab, is we've used a trick to make one side of a rat brain hypersensitive to dopamine. We've done that by actually making the rat hemi-Parkinsonian. We've killed the dopamine neurons on, on one side. Uh, interestingly, unlike humans with Parkinson's disease, the rats seem to recover very well and, uh, and, and function and eat normally. Um, but again, here's homeostasis. In the absence of dopamine inputs, the, the receiving nerve cells on that side become more sensitive to dopamine. It's the opposite of what happens with cocaine. And 
when we take these rats and we give them a dopamine stimulus, so here's the point, um, each of these different pictures detects the turning on of genes in the rat's brain. I'll tell you what that means in a second. But we found here about 30 some odd genes that are turned on by dopamine, and we have reason to suspect that dopamine actually probably activates about 70 genes. Well, what, what does this mean, activating a gene? It's very important to recognize that um, we have, and if I can have the next slide, Let's see if I, oh no, I didn't, uh, we, we, we have to go back. I didn't put in one, one, uh, one other cartoon slide. Uh, we, we can, what, what do we mean by activating a gene? Well, what are genes? So genes are, are, are stretches of DNA, and most of the genes that we have have the information for making proteins. And proteins, what are proteins? Proteins are the building blocks of cells. And for example, all receptors are proteins, and even some of the neurotransmitters are proteins, and all of the chemical synthetic machinery in cells are proteins. Now, we have in our cells, in each cell, all 80,000 genes that it takes to make a human being. And there are mechanisms which have the following role. They say to a gene, you can make your protein, you can be on in my cell, to some of them, and you cannot be on in my cell to others. Well, let's have an example. Well, in our scalp, to take a silly, but it, well, as I'm getting more middle-aged, actually, it's something I care about, uh, the genes are on to make the proteins that make hair. And, but we wouldn't want these genes on, for the most part, in our brains, right? Uh, we want the genes on to make hemoglobin in our red blood cell precursors, uh, we don't want those on in our scalp. So there are, are control mechanisms to keep some genes off in some cells and other genes on in other cells. But this isn't enough. This gets us to this idea of homeostasis. And in adapting to the environment, we actually have to make more or less of the key structural molecules of our cells, proteins, and we do this by turning genes on and off. Well, here's another example. Um, let's imagine you, for one reason or another, have decided that you want to bulk up. So you go to the gym and start lifting weights. And um, the, so the, the result of this is you, of course, have very sore arms. <laughs> but if you lift enough weight, enough times a week, for enough weeks, what happens? You, you start to develop larger muscles. Well, what, what has happened? A message has gone from the membrane of the muscle cell suggesting a stressor, right? And as an adaptation to that stress, a signal has gone to the nucleus of the cell and said to the genes, we need to make more structural proteins. We need to adapt. Okay, I'm sorry for this teleological sounding talk, but accept it as a shorthand rather than as uh, mental sloppiness on my part. So we're very used to this, to turning genes on and turning genes off. So what this slide shows you is that dopamine turns on, at least in this experiment, 35 genes. And it's interesting, some of them are known, some of them are unknown, it gives us a lot of work to do in the lab. Um, but what are these genes doing? Some of them are involved in, in, this lo in this homeostasis, right, in changing the whole chemical set of the dopamine neurons, so that they, uh, the, 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 of the neurons receiving dopamine, so that short term they sort of turn down the gain and set a person up for withdrawal. So if you've turned down the gain on dopamine, right, because you're being bombarded by dopamine, now you stop taking cocaine, you have less dopamine and less responsiveness to dopamine, perhaps, than you've ever had before, and the person feels, you know, dysphoric, can't experience pleasure, and experiences drug craving. But more interestingly, and here, you know, this is, this is what I would desperately like to understand in its details, we think that some of these genes are involved in remodeling synapses, that is, in, literally in this learning function, in changing the connections in the brain that will uh, lead to this kind of now malign learning 
where an adaptive signal, you know, dopamine was there to tell us that something was good and life enhancing and should be approached, but now because of this Trojan horse molecule, uh, dopamine has been associated with all kinds of, uh, of unintended things, right? Uh, and, and we have reason to suspect that some of these genes are involved in synaptic remodeling based on what they are. And I, I'm not going to bother you with that. Okay, so now if we can have the last slide, mercifully. What have I told you? Well, I've told you that uh, the brain uh, is not one thing. There are modules that the brain uh, is, works by what we might call distributed information processing. Uh, that some of these circuits are actually involved in the processing of emotional information. And that emotional processing leads to profoundly encoded memories. Uh, I've shown you, the reason I've shown you the data is so that this is not just a story. You can begin to see the physical evidence that this might be the case, and the physical evidence that this might even be the case in the human brain. I've told you that a certain amount of emotional processing leads not just to conscious, you know, I feel good, I'm frightened, but to powerful automatic behaviors that are involved in, uh, that are involved in survival, right? That uh, that evolution has given us so that uh, we don't think our way out of doing things that might save our lives. So what does this mean for addiction? Is addiction a brain disease? Is it a moral problem? Well, now the brain allows us to have a number of perspectives on this. First of all, I, the, the boundaries of disease are, uh, are a social construct. Actually, these days they're a construct of HMOs. Uh, but uh, arguably, if disease means that there's an important change in an organ producing dysfunction, uh, what I've shown you is that there are important physical changes in the brain. There, you, you can't see them, uh, Pache, Norman, without a microscope, uh, uh, or even uh, perhaps they're too small even to see with a microscope, but there are real physical changes in the brain producing dysfunction. And because these changes occur in powerful emotional circuits that are involved in prioritizing behaviors. That was good, let's do it again, let's remember how we did it. Um, these circuits gain a certain amount of control of behavior. But at the same time, and we know much less about the potential overriding circuits that must involve our frontal cortex, we know that, th that this is not the whole story. That at the same time, uh, there, there are other parts of the brain uh, that we have, in essence, a uh, perhaps parts of the brain that are unaffected by these adaptations uh, that can be uh, engaged by physicians, right? That when we ask people to take responsibility for themselves, and we don't have the details of this, uh, but, but I think you can see that we can begin to tell a story where we can have powerful, drug or experientially driven changes that affect behavior, and at the same time, uh, other parts of our brain may re remain, in this case, relatively healthy, able to uh, be engaged by other kinds of stimuli, uh, and so we can have a brain disease, but not lose moral agency, not lose our ability uh, to be addressed as human beings. And why don't I stop there and take questions? Yes. I, I translate some of this into lay terms, if I may. Yes. I take it from what you say that just as physical behavior can be approved by outside uh, effort, outside introduction to drugs. Absolutely. 
absolutely. And had I known of that work, it would have saved me years of research. <laughs> Yes. Sorry, talking to this. Um, I think it was. Um, oh, sorry. My name is Stephen Gelman. I'm a doctoral student in um, health and social behavior at the School of Public Health. Um, I think it was really exciting to hear about how um, the brain responds often permanently to uh, the introduction of substances, drugs, um, and other insults. And I was wondering if you might comment on how the brain responds to. Uh, psychosocial and environmental uh, insults, yes, yes. such as um, the continued stress of living in uh, environments with high income inequality. Or well, well, of course, it's very hard to do that particular experiment, but indeed there are some relevant experiments, uh, um, and it's early days in understanding this. But let me just describe some experiments. We, we have a, a, more, a Canadian experiment, actually, uh, that was just published in, in the last year. Uh, which took a very old observation in uh, behavioral neurobiology, which is that if, if you had rat pups and an investigator took a rat pup out, handled it, and then gave it back to its mother, ultimately that rat pup would, for life, have a different set, actually greater stability and less reactivity of its stress hormone axis. And uh, the experiment has just been done, I think, fairly convincingly that understanding the mechanism is that after an investigator has touched a rat pup and you put it back in, the, the mother is, starts obsessively licking, presumably to get the human smell off the pup, uh, licking and uh, grooming the pup. And uh, what the investigators then did is they went on and just divided rat mothers into the highest quartile of lickers and the lowest quartile of lickers and <laughs> correlated the uh, the the, and these are not inbred rats. So th this is not a, I mean, there, there are genetic predispositions to everything, but this is not predominantly a genetic effect. Um, and it turned out that the, the pups of the, of the dams that licked them a great deal had for life, at least for a year, which is a long time in rat life, a more stable set of its stress hormone axis. So you can begin to see you can tell yourself a story. I don't want to take this too far. You know, one can really be get into wild flights of speculation, but you can begin to imagine how life experiences might, uh, during, especially during development, uh, really alter very important functions in, in the way the brain is set up. Uh, and, and of course, we have to be very careful, I mean, uh, in the sense that uh, information about critical periods in the development of the visual system, right, meaning that um, in, in very early years, absent normal visual stimulation, so if a, if a baby has a cataract, the visual system forms in such a way that one eye may be permanently blind or you don't have binocular vision. That, that kind of data has now been taken and sort of generalized to all of these kinds of more social systems and in the popular literature, uh, you begin to see arguments as to whether you should be playing Mozart or Beethoven to your child in utero in order to enhance their intelligence. So, so I don't want to generalize too much, but, but these are very interesting beginnings. Yes. Hi, I'm Brian Johnson, yes. and I just wanted to ask, what about the rats that are the knockout ones, with no dopamine and serotonin, yeah. still want cocaine? What okay. do you think of that? Okay, so, well, this is a tech, so through genetic technology, we can now inactivate genes in the rat, I'm sorry, in the mouse, pretty much at will. And what people, uh, actually Mark Caron at Duke did, is he, he removed the gene that is targeted, that whose protein is targeted by cocaine, the dopamine reuptake transporter. So these animals now live in a high dopamine state all the time. And it's amazing to watch films of these animals or to see them. They're running around, you know, just, uh, just running over their, their litter mates uh, who don't have this gene knockout, you know. Uh, uh, again, you could tell yourself a story that this is, this is murine hyperactivity. Um, these 
animals still will self-administer cocaine, and it's for the technical reason that cocaine is a rather dirty compound that will also enhance the release of another neurotransmitter, serotonin, which interacts with dopamine. So they have high baseline dopamine, and the serotonin adds on to that and seems to be rewarding. I, I don't want to go into the details of that, uh, but what you uncovered is that I, uh, I, one of my simplifications. Bob. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, Bob. Okay. <laughs> I'm Deborah Marshall, a uh, Kennedy School student, mid-career student, coming from uh, one of those families with centuries of uh, being born with two drinks below par. Hmm. And um, I'm, I'm not sure if, if this is correct, but I, I think it would be very helpful if your scientific research is helping particularly the upper middle class alcoholics to understand that it's not a moral issue. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's a very key mm -hmm. thing in right. treatment and that that's a, a something that, that we run up against all the time. Yes. And I, it sounds like that's where this is leading, you know, but well, that's, that's uh, well, really important. Right. So if you take the public health view, right, you, I mean, you, uh, well, let, let me just leave the science. Let me speak as somebody who's been a doctor uh, b before, now, now I'm in the government, but. Uh, <laughs> um, so if somebody comes who's already addicted, okay, alcoholic, and a doctor starts by blaming them and moralizing, what that person is very likely to do is to turn tail and, and run. So it is very useful for the physician to take this medical, have this medical model that this is a disease. And what do we do with any disease? We don't blame somebody for having a disease. If somebody comes in with coronary artery disease, we don't sit down and say, you have this because you were a couch potato and this is your punishment, right? right. Um, exactly. Uh, what we do is we say, you know, okay, you have this disease, but now that we know that, you have a responsibility to take care of it. Now, of course, for heart disease, that's hard enough. For these diseases, of course, the organ of compliance and the circuits that are involved in setting behavioral priorities have been changed. So the doctor has to be both implacable and patient, meaning uh, they're up against a, a, a very tough enemy and also patient because you know people are going to relapse, and that's not total failure. And, and also because, to date, Western science doesn't have an antidote for this disease. There no, isn't that's right. a pill. There, no, isn't there's no, a, there is no There is no. Right. You can't pill. do chemotherapy. You can't right. have an operation. But, and, you know, so it's stymied in a sense. But I would, so one of, the, one of the interesting things is that it's not clear that we will have pills to reverse learning. Um, and, and so psychosocial interventions may remain uh, very, very important uh, uh, for maybe forever. I mean, because we can't indiscriminately erase learning. But let me say, you know, just as the brain, I've argued that the brain is not one thing and that different circuits have different roles. The doctor is one role in our society. There's also another role for the policeman, right? To say ahead of time before somebody is addicted, you know, um, um, you know, this is bad. Uh, it, it creates a context in which people are less likely, if this is done right, not if it's done in the wrong way, to get into trouble. And in our society, there's no more shrill policemen than the American Heart Association, right? telling us, you know, what we should or shouldn't eat. Uh, and presumably this, this creates an environment in which one is less likely to uh, misuse substances or what, what have you. Bob. Yes, Steve, it was a fascinating talk. I have two questions, one on the addiction side yes. and one on the responsibility yes. side. Okay. Uh, I don't oh, know yeah. that I fully understand <laughs> yes. Yes. the, the addiction right. connection with memory. That's, yes. that's what okay. I'd like to hear about. There's an automatic system you pointed out right. with fear right. that operates quickly below right. the level right. of cognitive right. processing right. to produce right. uh, reactions like yes. flight and so on. Yes. Now, in the case of the positive yes. thing, after it's cleared out of the system, so yes. you're no longer yes. having withdrawal right. symptoms, right. you've said we have emotional memories, remember the sight of the needle, the sight of the neighborhood, yes. right. the sight of right. the old friends. Okay. So, they're remembering that there was a good feeling associated right. with this. They right. haven't forgotten it. That's correct. But I don't yet see how we're getting to the compelling of the behavior at that point okay. from the memory. Are, are okay. you saying, right. so, okay. go ahead. Okay, so you're, you're very astute because in fact, there's not as good a story as for the fear side, less is known. So let me 
without being evasive, just do the fear side, and, and because it gives us yes. a scaffolding for how we want to think about the positive side. On the fear side, let's imagine that uh, you were uh, out on a hike, and uh, you came to a certain place, and you were almost bitten by a rattlesnake. Okay, then let's imagine years later you're hiking again. Um, and you're paying attention to the flowers, but it, it's a setting, a context, just like the one where you were bitten before. I think what you would find, if you suddenly got tuned in, you'd realize your heart was already racing, right? If someone measured your blood pressure, it would be up. In essence, this automatic system would already be, based on the context, getting you ready to respond. Whether or not you actually, the penny dropped, you said, oh yeah, this is the kind of place where I came across a snake. Yes. On the positive side, we don't have that kind of information yet. The argument, however, is that, um, is that this nucleus accumbens is, is there to create automatic biases toward things that have previously been associated with pleasure. And, um, and it's just been very hard because of, frankly, the way this part of the brain is built to get the same quality of physiologic data. But the, the belief, the argument is that, uh, that prior experience with drugs of abuse uh, privileges certain cues in terms, you know, that is, you know, your, your old friends, your shooting gallery, in terms of gaining access to this automatic system, which is going to bias you toward these approach behaviors. Right. So, so in principle, experiments if they haven't already been done, can be done to detect what the changes actually are when you see pictures of needles or see a needle. Oh, yes, those, those kinds does. of things have been done. And, right. and those, those and have been done with PET scanning, and you right. do see activations in actually in the amygdala, which is the, which right. is an, you know, I, I don't want to get into, but that's a, a part of the brain which is it also involved in negative emotions. Yes. So, but, but also yes. to get to the compelling yes. part, when in, in your scenario, when you're back and seeing uh, the place where the snake right. was, you may be getting physiological changes, but you're not, not yet running up the pathway, right? The action isn't actually coming That's in. So, so for, the, for the actual taking of the drug later on in that setting, you need some connection between the biasing predisposition and the actual doing of Ab the thing absolutely. to show that it was compelled or, that, or whatever, right? That, that's absolutely right. And, right. and maybe what I didn't say very clearly uh, is that there's this, there's this bias, but it is not fate. I mean, that's, yes. you know, right? But, but now the last question on yeah. the other side about yeah. whether it is fate or not. In your explanation of where there's room for a disease and, and responsibility both is that there are different modules. There's going to be the physiological module that's mm -hmm. connected with the disease, but there's going to be another module that involves our making choices or, or something right. like that. But now the question is we need a theory of the interaction yes. of those modules okay. in general, and, and it's not yet clear yes. in the case yes. Yes. where you have the physiology of the sort that you're deciding yes. that the choice module has a fighting chance right. or not, or that, how well, it works. Okay, we need so, okay. so that's, that, again, that, very astute oh. in the sense that in fact, those modules are probably not entirely separate. Uh, indeed, uh, probably all choice, all behavioral choice, probably involves the prefrontal cortex and the striatum, you know, the part of the brain that contains the nucleus accumbens, as well as these more automatic biases. And uh, I don't think anybody can yet give us a really good theory for uh, for how these things get, uh, or, or either under what circumstances they're separate, under what cir circumstances they work together. But I think, I think clinically, we get the sense that uh, that the automatic bias is often extremely powerful, and that the uh, the voice of reason uh, is is relatively weak. And in fact, one of the jobs of families and of doctors, and, and I've used this metaphor before is almost to serve as a prosthesis, right, to help shore up um, in a social sense the, those, the, the, the choice making part. And, you know, it get, gets very sloppy because you start crossing lines between, I, I don't want to act as if, you know, parts of the, I don't want to conflate, um, you know, moral choice with a brain structure or a brain process. So 
uh, so again, please accept this as a shorthand. I think all of us would have a strong emotional intuition about this, but philosophically, how would you answer a cocaine user if he was to say to you, why is it inherently wrong that I'm making myself oh, happy well, wrong. by, ta okay. by well, tapping into this mechanism okay. that you use every time you, you're, you yourself right. are happy? So, so, so wrong. So this is an, so uh, this gets into uh, the issue of what is the social construct here, right? So we would argue that people who are, as a doctor, who are addicted to drugs um, tend to have really terribly negative personal consequences ultimately and, uh, and, and, and terrible consequences for social productivity. I mean, you can make a communitarian argument, right? Uh, but what you can't say ahead of time, this is very much, again, and the reason I keep bringing up the example of heart disease, which is much less stigmatized, is we don't know ahead of time who's going to get captured. Um, now, in alcoholism, it's interesting. It really runs in families, and I think people, some people may be surprised because they haven't had an alcoholic in their family, but if they're alcoholics in the family, actually people should know that they have a, a real risk. But for cocaine or heroin, that's much less clear, and not everyone is captured. Um, so the argument has got to be, you know, uh, society ha wants to protect you, paternalistic, but wants to protect you from taking these risks. And uh, just think of the current anti-tobacco arguments, okay? Let's, let's think about how these play out. Um, uh, the tobacco companies say that smoking is a, is a choice. And of course, initiating smoking as an adult might be a choice. But what we know is that almost everyone who becomes addicted to cigarettes is addicted before the age of 18 and most before the age of 15. Um, and what's going on, society would say, in adolescence? They're, they're not really making a choice. They're being influenced by their peers. They want to look cool. Uh, tragically, for some women, it's a way of appetite control. You know, we have another problem there. Um, and then by the time somebody is put mature enough to think these things through, they find that they're trapped. So, you know, part of society is saying, you know, this is, this is very bad indeed. And another part of society is saying, well, of course, this is how we get our replacement smokers, you know. Um, so um, so the, the moral judgments that are made are part of society using stigma and laws and rules in order to try to create or decrease the risk of what collectively, not everybody, but collectively we've agreed is a bad outcome or the risk of a bad outcome. And you can argue whether that's right or wrong, but that's, I think, a description of what's happened. My name is uh, Andy Munoz, and I'm a doctoral student at the Graduate School of Education, and I do research on the moral development of uh, children and adolescents at, at risk. And my question to you might be too applied for the setting, but it may run to policy, and, mm -hmm. and perhaps you could comment. Um, depending on how you add it up, we have an increasing population of children in places like residential treatment centers and youth jails, maybe as many as 5% as of all the children under 18 nationally. It's also very expensive. It runs about 70000 a year mm -hmm. per child on average for kids in that kind of care. When you sp Now, I know the study of emotional circuitry is, mm -hmm. in a sense, in its, its infancy. Very but much. when you say to me that you study fight or, or flight, you know, those words come right out of the, the uh, uh, social treatment and yes. diagnosis right. of those right. kids. And to a certain extent, by plucking them out of their neighborhood, putting them in a youth detention center, and prescribing Prozac, we create a certain form of, of social homeostasis for them in which they no longer need to, to fight or flight, but have a time when they stop out of society and, and they're, in a sense, emotionally forced to be uh, in, in balance. Um, do you see this work running in that 
kind of, is that good or bad? Is this work running in that kind of direction? Well, I would say and it's going to be a very, very long time. Uh, as you can see from some of the questions which probed my current layer of simplifications and smoke screen, um, we're having trouble really explaining these things satisfactorily yet in, in rats. And I was careful actually in the example about, you know, uh, emotional development to make sure that we don't allow this brain metaphor to run riot. Uh, uh, but uh, but uh, let, let me just say a few things. So, um, uh, so you mentioned Prozac in, in a slightly different context, but, but it's sort of interesting. We have an epidemic of childhood depression. And actually a lot of kids who get in trouble uh, turn out probably in retrospect to have had unrecognized depression. And we know their outcomes are terrible. But by the same token, we have no information on what uh, long-term Prozac use does you know, to, to brain development. We just have no information. I can't make a judgment on it. Right. Wearing my, uh, one of my hats, I have to worry about how we're going to get that information ethically. I mean, how, how can you do a trial uh, in children to find out uh, the, the outcome? Um, it's, it's, uh, but we do have to worry about that. Now, in terms of, um, in terms of youth detention and so on, you, there is, and, and this gets away from the brain entirely, but we know, you, we, there's an enormous controversy about the role of these contexts. I mean, in, there, there's not, you can't establish causality with experiments, but there's a sort of a pathway analysis which suggests that aggregation with deviant peers is the leading risk factor for a criminal career. And some would argue that creating you know, detentions in youth prisons is creating a graduate school for uh, criminal behavior and maybe absolutely the worst thing that society can do. Um, and, and obviously there's a raging debate because there are um, obviously professional organizations of people who run group homes. And, uh, uh, and, but the brain, the, the brain information just cannot nearly begin to address these issues. I think it would be foolish even to try at this point. There are too many variables to make that connection. One, one just quick follow-up comment, um, especially being on the national board for the folks who do run those group mm -hmm. homes, though, is, is to advocate real uh, attention to research for that population. Mm -hmm. If I had to pick mm -hmm. one sig single risk factor, it's the fact that, that a, a vast majority of those kids, as we approach 5% of, of the youth population at, at 70,000 uh, a year have all been, this was so resonant for me right, right. in a policy way because they have all been um, exposed to drugs in one way or another. And, and we can map, for example, whole family histories of, of, of cocaine addiction mm -hmm. and then the self-medication as something that brings those kids in these. Right. Those yeah, I, I, I mean, you're, it's, I think I, I can't really answer in, in this time. I, just w I didn't want to speak against group homes. I just want to highlight that there's this enormous controversy there, and I, I can't, it would be specious to bring the brain argument into these kinds. Of, it's just premature. Thank you.